We're gonna have him on stage right now. Please put your hands together for Scott Bennett. Hello, Toronto. How's everyone today? My name's Scott Bennett, and I'm from Home Improvement Woodworking. I'm really excited today to be sharing some information with you about woodworking for home improvement projects. How many people here have seen one of our videos? Okay, we've got some hands here, that's great. So what I want to do today is share with you a few things. And the first thing is, I love to build. I have loved to build since I was a child. If some of you share that passion, you recognize Lego. As I grew up, I got into car models. Started assembling those, learning how they worked, and then I got into airplane models, which were a little more complex. I eventually got into woodworking. My dad did it as a hobby, and by grade eight, I was doing woodworking in school, and I worked through a number of different projects, including a chessboard. By the time I got to high school, I started enrolling in some woodworking courses, but I was studying to go to eventually the University for Business. In those days of learning woodworking, I ended up competing in the Durham region competition for cabinet making. In grade 11, I won the medal there, the gold medal, went on to the Ontario level, won the silver medal, and then represented Canada in the United States Skill Olympics and competed there against every, uh, one person from every state in the US, someone from Puerto Rico, and myself. I was able to do that in grade 12 as well, so it was a really good experience. Later in life, I got into home improvements. And for me, this has been a lifetime of me building skills. Today, what I want to share with you are four things. I want to talk to you about skill building. I want to talk about what tools do you use. That's a common question. Talk about workshop setup and safety as well. Can anybody tell me what type of screwdriver that is? Robertson. Robertson. And why is a Robertson unique? It's got four corners, which makes it an awesome driving tool. This uh, Robertson here, I've shown you the screw. Do you guys know that this was a Canadian invention? Yeah. Yes, that's right. So it was patented in 1909, and it was manufactured in Milton, Ontario, not far from here. So a great pride source for Canadians. This was my first home here in Toronto. This is on O'Connor Drive. For those of you who might be familiar with the area, it's north of Greektown, south of Leaside a typical wartime bungalow in Toronto. When my wife and I bought this, we were really proud. It was our first home, and it had an unfinished basement and a kitchen that needed some help. But the first thing my insurance company told me was, you need to get rid of the knob and tube wiring. If you guys haven't heard of that, it's really unsafe wiring and very common in vintage homes in Toronto. So I took a week off work, rewired the house top to bottom, and that was my first home improvement project. The second one is this. On the left was our original kitchen, original wallpaper behind those cabinets. On the right was our kitchen renovation. I built 23 cabinet doors, uh, bought some cabinets and built cabinets where I needed them. And uh, this was the late 90s. So back then, this was a very stylish kitchen. It doesn't look that stylish right now. And in retrospect, um, we should have upgraded that stove, but as new homeowners, money's tight, so that wasn't in the budget. Not long after this renovation, my wife and I were really happy with it, and I was reading a magazine, Canadian Home Workshop magazine, and I saw this, the ultimate basement contest. So I showed it to my wife, and she was immediately excited about it, but I was a little hesitant because I read the rules, and I had five months to do it if I won. So that meant every evening and every weekend. And oh, by the way, my wife was early pregnancy for our first child. So I needed my wife to understand, if we were doing this, I wasn't going to be around much. So we ended up putting together a submission. Lori said, yep, let's go ahead, let's do it. I put a 16-page submission together. I built the existing floor plan on a page, what the new floor plan would look like. I did a furniture plan. I did a furniture elevation. I included that kitchen reno and said, hey, we can do this. 16 pages, put it together in a foil, and I couriered it. Yes, this was the 90s. I couriered it off to the magazine. I had friends and family that knew about this. We've got a few friends in the crowd today. Um, and we were really excited about this. And the time came where they were supposed to announce the winners. And we were waiting and waiting and waiting. And nothing happened. So it was five weeks later. And we thought, OK, well, someone else has won. I was in my office at work. My phone rang. I answered, Scott Bennett, you won the Ultimate Basement Contest. So this is five weeks later. I'm thinking, one of my friends is prank calling me. 
Well, the hesitation must have come across on the phone. They said, let me introduce myself. My name's Doug. I'm the editor of Canadian Home Workshop Magazine, and you have won the Ultimate Basement Contest. Wow. <laughs> Excitement. That was a really important time for us that, uh, you know, it, it was acknowledgement of some of the stuff that we thought we could do, but now I had to prove it. So I'm going to show you some photos so you can appreciate this process. The first one here, this is the basement, what it looked like when we bought the house. It was concrete walls, um, all kinds of clutter. I found a few vintage tools in the mix. We've even got one of those pencil sharpeners that you used to use in school. Um, that was in the basement too. Um, so I want you to note the location of the window here, because I'm going to show you some progress shots, and that'll just orient you in terms of what this looks like. Um, part of the process was I had to get a building permit from the City of Toronto to make sure this was all done within code. So I had to go through several levels of inspection. This was the insulation inspection. So you can see that window as well. Um, here I'm measuring for the fireplace, which was one of those prizes. So $5,500 in prizes, one of them was a fireplace with a chimney. Awesome. Um, so here, and you can see the stack of drywall that we ended up using in the basement. Another progress shot here, we put wainscoting throughout to really elevate the feel of this. We had an older home that had lots of character and style in it, and we wanted to carry that character through the house. So we didn't want a new basement and an older home above. We carried that character throughout. I went through and bought a paint sprayer, my first paint sprayer, because I had tons of painting to do of trim. And this is the magazine. Here you can see what the finished product looked like. In the inset picture top left uh, was an office uh, with a French door put in, built-in um, desk. And you can see the detail on the windows. Uh, rather than just framing a regular window, I flared them on a 45 degree to give more light, make those windows appear bigger than they were. The bottom half of this page shows more detail. Uh, the bathroom was on the left. It's a two-piece bath. It's got a linen cabinet built in, inspired by a St. Jacob's um, bed and breakfast my wife and I stayed in. Uh, two doors, uh, six drawers. Uh, in the center down at the bottom is the heat register, copying the same details on the main floor into the basement to give it that cohesiveness. And then a very compact laundry room there with some vintage doors we put on. Here we are now, uh, over the last year and a half, I've taken all the skills and knowledge that I've got and started sharing them with people. So I put together home improvement woodworking where people can watch, they can learn, and they can build. And that's really what we hope to share with people, is inspire people that you can do these jobs as well and show you how. Hi, I'm Scott, and welcome back to Home Improvement Woodworking. So let's start talking about skill building. Where do you start? Well, the simple answer is where you are right now. No matter whether you've touched a tool or you've had some experience, where you start is where you are right now. There are two typical life events where people get into this. One is as a new homeowner. Typically as a new homeowner, you've spent a lot of money and you don't have a lot of budget. So you want to improve your home. Um, you resort to looking to do things yourself. And another life stage is starting retirement. A wonderful time where you've got lots of time and you're looking for something to do and keep yourself busy. I want to share with you that skill is two things. One is knowledge. You can't have skill without knowledge. And the other is experience. You can't be skilled without experience. So knowledge plus experience gives you skill. So the first thing you need to look, do is look at accumulating knowledge. And this is similar to learning math in school. Do you remember way back in grade five you were learning math and you were struggling through it and you could not imagine doing grade 8 math because you had to get through grade 5 and then grade 6 and then grade 7. Accumulating your knowledge for home improvements and woodworking is exactly the same. You need to start with the basics and build up from there. You're going to build your woodworking knowledge year after year and I would recommend reading magazines or well curated websites. So there's a few magazines that I enjoy reading. One is Fine Woodworking. So if you're looking at doing woodworking specifically, another one is popular woodworking. So those are a few things you can look at to get you started. Be patient. Um, I can't stress this enough. 
don't go out there and try and do a, your very first project where you've never done anything before. That's a huge project. Start small, get some experience, because every project you do, you're going to learn and you're going to grow. Gaining experience is about applying that knowledge. So you've now got some new knowledge, you want to apply that knowledge to get some experience. Every time you build, you're going to learn something. You might make a mistake, you might get a little mark on your hand, you're going to learn a few things. The next thing you want to do is look at projects that you will fulfill a need. Don't just make up a project, look at something around your home. It could be assembling IKEA furniture. If you take a stack of wood, follow the instructions and put it together, you start to gain the knowledge and the experience of how things go together. It could be things like repairing a door, we've got a video on that for you. You could be upgrading baseboards or replacing countertops. Let's talk about as a new homeowner building your skills. You've got a desire to improve your home and you probably have a tight budget. If you bought a home and you don't have a tight budget, you're probably not going to get into DIY stuff, am I right? So that's the first part. Um, learn alongside a more experienced person. If you've got a family member or you've got a friend that's handy, make them your buddy. Um, learn with that person beside you. If you're lucky enough, you may be able to find a contractor you can hire that you can work beside. They're very rare. I found two in my lifetime, um, but it's always worth asking because you can learn so much from a pro. Start with small projects and build your experience and confidence. If you start small, you're going to be successful. If you try just knocking out of the park with a big one, um, your chances are you're going to fail and get frustrated with it. And YouTube is very helpful, but a word of caution for you. There are a lot of novices out there. So just be careful what you're watching. Make sure you're working with a pro. So retirement age. This is an exciting time, as I said, for someone who's just retired. You've got lots of time. Three weeks ago, I was at Lee Valley Tools on Morningside, and I was in a wood carving um, workshop, and I had to share a workbench, and this elderly lady who was retired was beside me. And we got to talking, and I said to her, oh, I have a hard time sitting still. I, I just can't sit still. And she said, I'm the same way. Two weeks ago, she had been in a crocheting class. The week of, she had learned how to do 3D printing at the library, and here she was learning how to wood carve. How inspiring is that? So I thought that was a really good story. In uh, high school, um, if you can take an evening class as someone who's new to woodworking, um, this is the best place to learn because learning these skills, you can watch and you can repeat. You can watch and you can repeat. But if you have someone observing you, showing you how you can do things better, more efficiently, more safely, that's the best learning environment for you. So uh, check those out, high school classes. Seek out woodworking clubs or maker spaces. Um, how many people have heard of a maker space? It's a relatively new term. Um, maker spaces are where people come with woodworking, to learn woodworking, to learn metalworking, to learn computer programming, to learn about drones, to learn about all kinds of building things. These are people that want to make things regardless of what the material is. There are maker spaces, there's one in Oshawa, there's another one in Newmarket that I'm aware of. But these maker spaces are set up with the tools and people that know this stuff. So you can go in there and become part of that community and learn how to make things. Again, start small and build your experience. And if you're retiring, I encourage you to dream big. If you've got a dream or five years down the road you want to build yourself a harvest table, that's something to work towards. Let's talk about power tools. Fun topic, right? I've built a list for you guys, and this is on my website, so if you want to check it out, it's there, about must-have power tools and nice-to-have. The first one is a circular saw. For those of you who haven't seen one before, this is what a circular saw looks like. It's a saw for cutting straight lines, not curved lines, straight lines. Also a drill. You guys have probably all seen a drill. 
This is a quarter drill, it's a Makita. So circular saw and a drill. Drill bits, of course, for the drill. And a countersink bit set. If you've never seen a countersink bit set, what this is, is when you're driving a screw into wood, it cuts out the little spot for the top of the screw to be able to sit flat inside the wood. So it's got a cutter head at the top. You can buy those in sets of three typically. And then a random orbit sander. There's two types of sanders out there. The old fashioned ones are what they call a quarter sheet. It's square. Um, they tend to leave scratches in wood. You buy one that's round, an orbit sander. Works much, much better. So that's what I would recommend for your must have tools. If you're to go out and buy these brand new today, you're probably looking at three to four hundred dollars if you buy corded tools. Tools that plug into the wall. And that's what I recommend to start with. A, you'll never run out of battery. And B, they're less expensive and less of a commitment than buying cordless tools. The nice to have tools, an impact driver. How many people here have tried an impact driver before? A few people? Okay. For those of you who haven't, on your way out the front door, there's the how-to center. We're demonstrating these. These are awesome tools to be able to put screws in. It's much, much better than a drill. A miter saw, I didn't bring mine here, but you can see it in the how-to center. It's for cutting trim, typically for baseboards, quarter round, door trim. Yeah. I bought mine 20 years ago. It's a Makita, still running today. I had to take it in for service last week for the very first time. It cost me $82 to service it. So these tools last a long, long time if you buy quality. A jigsaw. So the circular saw is for cutting straight lines. The jigsaw is for cutting curved lines. So that's what a jigsaw looks like. If you're installing a cabinet and you've got plumbing pipes, you need to cut holes, um, that's the right tool for you. And a shop vacuum, cleaning up your mess, keeping things tidy, it speaks for itself. Quality power tools, I would encourage you not to buy the cheapest tool you can find. From personal experience, you'll end up with poor results because you've got a poor quality tool and you'll end up with breakage. I bought a store brand jigsaw one time. It lasted me a year and a half and it was out of warranty and it stopped working. The motor was running, but nothing was happening with the blade. I won't tell you what store it's from, but I ended up taking it apart and looking inside and where all the gears were together in a metal housing, that metal housing had just cracked wide open. There was no way to fix this thing. I went out that day and bought myself a DeWalt, a quality tool, and it's still working 15 years later, great tool. So don't look for the cheapest tool, but you don't need to aim for the moon either. You don't need to buy the most expensive tool. Aim for middle of the road. I suggest buying reputable brands, and here's what I use in my workshop. Makita, DeWalt, Porter Cable, and Delta. Delta was around 20 years ago. If you can buy a used Delta machine, that's a good quality. And the last thing I've got for you as tips is stationary tools don't change that much. So I've got a table saw I've had for 20 years. There have been two innovations in table saws in 20 years. Portable tools are constantly evolving. This is a brand new Makita tool. These things are changing rapidly. So if you're buying portable tools, don't expect to get 20 years out of them because they are evolving and changing. Must have hand tools. So these are the basics to get you started. A combination square is the first one. This is a combination square. The ruler slides on it. It allows you to make sure things are square and on a 45 degree angle. You can also use this to adjust the length. So if you're working on a board, you can put a pencil here and you can draw a straight line all the way down it. It's a, a great tool for that. So combination square is the first one. The next one's a framing square. Looks like this, very common. Uh, quick grip clamps. So these are my favorite clamps. There's a couple different types of styles of clamps out there, but this is a quick grip. And basically your pumping action closes it. Nice rubbery pads on it. Um, woodworking clamps, you'll definitely need a few of those. Screwdrivers and hammer. Screwdrivers, you can buy yourself a whole set, but I would recommend this. This is made by Home Hardware. This is called Retractabit. And it's an innovation called, from Benchmark. And to get the piece out that you need, one-handed, there's your screwdriver. You pull the shaft in, pull it down, get to the next one, and like that. You're not fumbling with bits, and you can buy individual screwdrivers, but you have a whole set. This is what I've got in my kitchen drawer because I'm constantly using screws around the house. A measuring tape, I would recommend that specific one from Stanley that's got meters and feet on it. Reason is, in North America, our measurements are done in inches for woodworking. 
but when you're dealing with fine measurements and you're trying to figure out, okay, I'm halfway between an inch, so that's a half an inch. I'm halfway between that, that's a quarter of an inch. Now, what are these tip marks that I need for finer measurements? That can get very confusing to try and figure out whatever measurement that would be. If you switch to millimeters at that point, it's easy to count. I'm at 132 millimeters. Where I use this a lot is if I'm doing trim in a house or I'm doing wainscoting. I switch to millimeters, I draw on a piece of paper the room, I take all my measurements, go to my saw, make all my cuts, come back in, and nine times out of ten they fit. Might be a little trimming here or there. So get one with meters and feet as well. And of course a level, because we want our countertops to be level and we don't want things rolling around. We want our cabinets to be straight up and down, nice and plumb, so get yourself a quality level. All these tools roughly are about $200. So to get into woodworking, you're looking at five to six hundred dollars in terms of tools, and you'll have the basics to build things. More tools. There are some people that love tools. They buy and buy and buy tools. My recommendation is, first of all, use the store services available. You can get large pieces of material cut down, typically for free, at big box stores. So use those services where possible um, and save you buying bigger tools. Buy them only as you need them. So if you're working on a project, you're planning on a project, hey, I need a tool to do this, great time to buy it. But I don't recommend going out and just buying tools without having a purpose for them. Here are some examples, a belt sander, a stud finder, a rotor, a plane, a table saw. That's the plane I use most frequently in my workshop. Um, it's really near and dear to me. It was my great-grandfather's. It was passed down to the generations, so uh, it's working really well. In terms of supplies, there's just a few things you need. Um, have yourself some pencils and they get lost a lot, so you get lots of pencils. Wood glue and something to spread wood glue. This is a woodworking tip that not a lot of people are aware of. If you don't spread the glue across both surfaces, you won't get a good bond. And if you use your finger, you have oil on your hands, you compromise the strength of that glue. So get yourself a brush, brush it on both sides, and you'll have the maximum adhesion possible on that glue joint. Uh, blue masking tape is different than green masking tape. It actually has tension and it's more sticky. You can use it to help hold things in place and clamp. And screws. Number eight screws are the common width for a wood screw. And I use inch and a half the most in my workshop. Work surfaces. If you get two saw horses that you can put things on, that's a great start. If you get a workmate, and this is a workmate here that's about 35 years old, these workmates last a really long time. And the added advantage of having a surface like this, a workmate, is this clamps. So now you've got the ability to put wood in here, clamp it down, and then you can work on it. This is very portable, and I'll show you how that breaks down. That folds down, the legs fold up, boom, you can put it away. So it's a great portable tool, good sturdy workbench. Um, home Hardware sells them $139, or $35, um, so they're a good buy. And the ideal thing is to have a dedicated workbench. But you need a dedicated space for that and a dedicated vice. So that was my friend Andy. That was the first experiment I had on making a video with someone at their house. Um, so Andy agreed to, to play the starring role as the homeowner um, and I helped and guided him through that and as I took the viewers through that explained to him what was going on. Um, so check out that video about wainscoting. You can get some tips on improvement on, on your house. Ideally where you're working is the room that you're working in. So let's say you're building a closet organizer. Ideally you would work in that bedroom to build that out. Now, that's not always realistic because of the dust. If you rip the whole room apart and you can make that dust, great. If not, you're going to have to go somewhere else to make your dust. A lot of people navigate to the basement. Um, a word of caution around doing that, it is a good spot. It's heated. You've got space. But when your furnace runs, it moves air around. And if you're not careful, that air can migrate. And uh, you might have uh, the other half in your relationship asking you to dust the house the next week. Um, so you need to make sure you're paying attention to dust control. The other spot is a garage, and what you need to do is make sure you've heated that garage. These tools that are metal, if they get colder than 5 degrees Celsius or 40 degrees Fahrenheit, they will rust. 
So you need to keep that, heat, that space heated. Um, I explain a lot of that detail in a video um, around heating your garage. Um, I've got an insulated floor, insulated door um, that helped me do that in a small heater. The third option is the driveway. Um, when it's not snowing out like it is today, um, you can go in the driveway and, and make use of that space. The workshop setup, in terms of the working surfaces, um, the workbench is an ideal spot if you've got a dedicated space. If you want to see a really cool workbench that folds up into the wall, check out the home hardware. Here's house Center near the entrance here, and you can see one of those that fold up. It's really cool how it all comes together. The space here, what you want to do is make sure you don't have tripping hazards. So you want to make sure you've got enough room because there are sharp tools around and you don't want to have a trip and then injure yourself because you've got that around. So clear space is what you're looking for. You want to make sure you've got good lighting so you can see. Storage space and dust control because it is a health hazard. Um, most people don't know, uh, for those people that do woodworking full time, um, woodworking, uh, wood dust is a carcinogen. It causes cancer. So you need to make sure, and I'll cover that in a minute, um, you're wearing a respirator to protect your lungs from the damage that that can do. In terms of storage, you should make sure that each of your tools has a home, you're not constantly shuffling it around. Um, maximize the use of drawers. In my workshop, I bought a desk on Kijiji, it was $30, and I, I had an interest in repairing it for my daughter, the top needed replacing. It never happened, but the two drawer uh, areas on either side turned into storage space in my workshop. So for $30, I had some drawers. A tool cabinet for your power tools and make use of the wall space. Um, I've got a video that shows how to get your recycling bins off the ground and onto the wall. You can see that in the Here's House section. We're starting to build one of those um, to make more space. And the frequently used tools should be visible. So if you're using them a lot, make sure that you can see exactly where they are and you don't have to go looking for them. This is an example of my workshop, and it doesn't look that nice. Um, my recommendation here is invest a little bit of time in making your workspace enjoyable. This is a more enjoyable workspace for me now. So um, while well, you can make it functional, make it enjoyable as well if you're going to spend a lot of time there. So power tool safety, my number one recommendation is do not learn power tool safety from the internet. Every one of my videos, when you see me cutting or whatever, I've got a warning, this is not to teach you safety. And the reason that that is, is learning tool safety is a two-way communication process. You can watch something and you can repeat it, but there's no one standing over your shoulder telling you you're doing it wrong. Uh, years ago, I had spent some time training a, a young girl about how to use a table saw, and I was really nervous about doing that, teaching someone else how to do this but it made me realize that there was absolutely no way she could learn this on her own without someone standing over her shoulder and showing her exactly what to do and exactly what she was doing wrong. You need someone there to observe and correct what you're doing to learn tool safety. So please, don't rely on the internet for this. Take a woodworking introduction class in high school. I mentioned this before. This will give you the opportunity to get feedback on what you're doing and respect the power of the tools. Some of these machines run at thousands of RPM and they've got sharp blades. If you don't respect the physics of what's going on here, you could easily end up in some trouble. You need to concentrate and focus. If you're using a router, if you're using a saw, you need 100% of your attention there. It's not a time to listen to a podcast. You need to focus. And the last advice for you is eliminate potential distractions. This is a, design, a sign I hang on my shop door when I'm working on machinery so that I don't have someone in going, Dad! <laughs> it, in the middle of a cutting operation, a fright like this makes your body jump and that can be disaster if you're cutting something. Personal protection equipment, PPE is what it's called in the industry. Safety glasses, no need to explain that. Hearing protection, when I was doing cabinet making competitions in high school, no one wore hearing protection, but two years ago I went to Skills Ontario and watched the cabinet making competition. Every single competitor had hearing protection. So people have learned this is important stuff. I didn't bring my hearing protection today. And the third one is wear a respirator, not a dust mask. A respirator fits tightly onto your face and forces the air to come through the filters that protect your lungs. A dust mask has gaps around it and air flows where the least friction is. So the dust mask does not protect your lungs as a respirator does. 
I've got an article and a recommendation on this equipment as well on my website. So I'd encourage you to go on to YouTube and check out the videos, we've got 49 of them there for you, where we want you to watch, to learn, and to build. If you want to notif get notified when our next videos come out, what you can do is click on subscribe, and then click on that bell icon that's beside there, and as soon as our videos get released, typically on Saturday mornings, you'll get notified and you'll be able to watch the videos. So I'd like to close by saying, my name's Scott. I'm from Home Improvement Woodworking, and until next time, enjoy your time in the workshop. Hey,